We are week two of the Disrupt Space Artist Takeover, and I'm really pleased to be meeting Isis Rahim, uh, who's just come on Zoom. Hi, Isis. Hey. So you're a webcomic artist and an illustrator. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about your, your background. I graduated in 2014. I studied computer animation. Um, but I never really had any intention of joining the industry. Um, I'm not really interested in the sort of animations that you'll see sort of like on the big screen. Um, so I suppose I'm interested more in ideas and technique and what they teach at universities technique. Um, I was kind of more politically active then in the sense that I'd attend a protest for things that, um, for ideas that, you know, I sort of believed in. At that time, I was sort of um, reading out a lot of material on uh, philosophy, politics, uh, some economics. Um, and I reached out to some of the uh, student activist groups um, and we'd like, uh, we'd go around together. Uh, protests and what have you. And following your journey as like as a political, you know, active uh, young student, then oh yeah, know, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. Your work evolve um, to start to incorporate that because I can hear at uni it was quite like you know structured. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of it would like uh, I'd supplement it with reading and things like that, and then um, privately I'd uh, develop ideas, but there wasn't really space for that in the uh, curriculum. Um, which is which is fine. I mean, there's a lot to get through. Um, yeah, so it was all it was all uh, developed uh, at the side, completely separate from uh, the uh, the course. Yeah, and and so then you and then that's when you reached out to YouTubers to see if they wanted YouTubers that you already followed or yeah, right. So um, I'm interested in African history, and uh, there was this YouTuber. Um, who he makes videos on the topic and he has a uh, a discord forum so I joined the discord and um, just sort of I was just sort of like just there I wasn't really interacting with the community that much I was just sort of there and then uh, one of the guys came in he has a, a channel called like uh, useful charts he was looking uh, for an artist uh, he was working on a project to do with uh, like medieval uh, Songhai Empire or the Mali Empire or something like that and uh, he wanted some portraits done of um, like Sunji Atakita and a few of the uh, other sort of reigning mansas at the time so yeah I, I created the portraits for him he was happy with that and uh, the guy here in the discord was like uh, you know you've done some really cool work for him could you could you maybe do the same for my channel so since then we've been uh, collaborating on projects so if he has an interesting video uh, and he needs something illustrated, uh, I'll do that. Mm, amazing. That's such a good combination. So you clearly love research and you're really fascinated by African history and the illustration, digital illustration. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I'm interested in um, African history and the way it informs ideas of uh, Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. I really like the aesthetics of Afrofuturism, but for me, like part of the essence of uh, visualizing the future is like, where have we been? You know, it's like, it's like there's the present moment now and there's the past and the future. And Afrofuturism, I think, needs to not, not almost like bypass where we are now, but reimagine how it would have been, how the past would have been carried forward without, uh, you know, the interruption of like, you know, transatlantic slave trade or whatever. So for me, it was like, I, I encountered the visuals, the visuals of uh, African culture and um, African, African people in the future just the image of that alone was powerful for me and what i didn't want to do was inherit people's idea of what Afri afrofuturism is because it's not a new idea um it's the, the the sort of concept of it has been floating around for a while basically what i didn't want to do was read the literature and reproduce what people were already doing so um uh, yeah I, I wanted to just like take this idea and run with it so I took what I what I studied from uh, African history, and um, I sort of exploring the ideas of how I play with tech now. So there's this idea of like um, you know the, the the ancient idea of a griot was a storyteller, somebody who could memorize like vast amounts of information, and then there's the idea of like uh, in tech we're we're approaching this uh, this this time where at the moment if you want to keep a secret there's, um, you know, you can use cryptography. Um, but with the advent of uh, quantum computers, which is sometime in the future, 
everything will be able to be decrypted. So the possibility of having private communication is like, it's going to be like zero, like something that will take them like a hundred thousand years to crack, they'll be able to crack in a day. And when that happens, that's like, it really is post privacy. So like, uh, how, how would you then, how would you then navigate that world? And like, how, how can African uh, history uh, influence that? And this is what I think, how I interpret Afrofuturism. So I thought, taking the idea of a griot and somebody with an incredible memory, what if you like put that on steroids? Like somebody could uh, remember thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of bits of information. So like a memory stick, that could be the new way you navigate the world as in like um, to carry one a secret from one place to another it's like you tell a griot he remembers everything every but it's not like it's like an encrypted version of information he remembers everything goes to a separate place and relays that information essentially so it's like it's a step forward in the sense that um, you know it happens in the future or whatever but it's like a, a low tech way of uh, solving that problem i think the the root of it is um the idea or the sort of like the i want to say the conflict between uh simplicity and complexity and how sometimes uh, simplicity can defeat uh, complexity and so it was yeah it was this idea of taking elements of the past uh, elements of african uh, culture and history and bringing that forward and saying what would a person like that look like um, in, in 20 years time? How, how would they help? Uh, how would they navigate uh, that landscape? Yeah, what role would they play? So I love the idea yeah. of being a human being that would actually outwit the quantum computer in the future. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's like, it's just concepts I'm playing with, but um, yeah. God, it sounds so much fun. It sounds, it doesn't sound like your brain switches off, Isis. <laughs> It, it doesn't. I'm a. I'm a. Um, one of the questions was, um, what What's your average? Like, you know, like what What kind of gets you going? Or like, yeah. what's your workshop like? Or whatever. And this made me laugh because, I mean, mostly I work from home, but I belong to uh, Leicester Hackspace, and um, it's open twenty four hours. So I would be there, you know, ticking over like two, three a.m. You know, going through stuff and. Um, most of the labs that I belong to close at like 10 p.m. So I can bounce around at night to locations. So I like mostly sleep through the day and uh, work at night. But um, yeah, I, I basically just uh, just keep keep kicking over. Um, so uh, so <laughs> you you basically get this idea and then it's just you go and you're exploring it and there's just it's that's your you you zoom zoom into that and you focus on it until you've come out the other side with a. Uh, an intervention or a uh, investigation that you can take into the public space and kind of invite people to participate. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly it. It's, a, it's an investigation. It's um, seeing what skills I need to acquire, acquiring those skills, and then finding a way to uh, yeah to present that to uh, to a public and 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 uh, see the reaction. Which is... So tell me, like, how's that then manifested as as works of art? These kind of ideas that you're playing with. Um, I have a graphics tablet. Uh, I work on the tablet um, straight into a, a, um, a 2D software package. And um, so it'll be like, uh, I use Clip Studio Paint, but people can use Photoshop and whatever else. Uh, so I work directly into digital. But um, recently I have been exploring um, screen printing. So I'll take these uh, digital pieces and um, yeah, I'll transfer them onto uh, uh, paper via screen printing. As, and they, they're fantastic. So those are the ones that you've uploaded. There's a few already on the Disrupt Space website. Uh, yeah, yeah. And what are those from? So I'm just I'm just looking at it now. So are these from um, the same comic? So we've got um, Rats in the Opera House and the filmmakers. That's really interesting. They've, they've all got the kind of the same motif. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um... The motif is taken, it's like an abstraction from, I don't know if you're familiar with the instrument, uh, the Cora. It's an instrument that a griot would use. And it, like a guitar, it has like a sound hole with strings going across it. And that symbol uh, is like an, an abstraction of, of the sound hole with the strings going across it of, of, a, of a Cora. So that's what it's taken from. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there is a, a unifying thread between all of them. They're not necessarily from the same comic, but they're, the, they're from the same, like, they're, they're the same, there's a concept underpinning them all. And the concept is um, the idea of, it's, it's Afrofuturist um, aesthetics, 
coupled with this idea of, of um, post satisfaction. So I was reading um, Yanis Varoufakis, the ex Greek uh, finance minister. Um, he had a book called um, A Brief History of Capitalism while talking to my daughter about the economy. He talks about his thought experiment and it features this mad scientist, Costas. And Costas builds a machine. It's a machine like the Matrix, but flipped on its head in the sense that instead of a machine that's supposed to uh, enslave humanity, it's a, it's a machine that's meant to serve humanity. It's meant to fulfill your every want and need, your every desire. And not only would it do that for you, but it would do that for the whole of humanity. So um, the, the, um, the thought experiment is, would you or would you not want to go into a perfect simulation um, of this world where your every desire is met? And um, he was saying that, you know, if you do, fair enough, but if you don't, like, you might be uh, puzzled as to why you might feel that way. And the idea is that satisfaction isn't everything. You know, the, the idea that um, part of who we are, part of uh, our character is formed by our confrontation with the world. And this idea that everything we want, our desires aren't met right away. That's what the machine symbolizes, this like post-satisfaction idea. And um, that was, that's the, the, the concept behind, the, the concept that underpins the work that I've created. For me, the sharing has already always been secondary, uh, the generation of the ideas. And that's, that's what I derive pleasure. I derive pleasure from being at the intersection of two disciplines and being the first sometimes to, to say like, ah, what if this goes with this or, um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, um, part of being like, part of maturing as an artist, part of trying to um, develop as an artist, is, is finding better ways to, um, is to, to share art. It has always come secondary to me, but uh, increasing it, it's becoming part of the process. Um, but I'm always wary to what degree I allow um, the sharing of art or the perception of others to, to influence what I do. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if I wasn't, it's hard to say what I would be or what I would do if I wasn't uh, creating art because it's such a fundamental part of who I am. Like if I had all the money in the world, I'd still be doing the same thing. I'd still be antagonizing people with my art. Like that's just, <laughs> it's, it's what I do. Um, I'd still be, I still want to be at, the, at an intersection of two disciplines because I feel that's where there's a potential for innovation. I mean, there's, I mean, as much as the art world likes to talk about, you know, oh, challenging this and doing this and doing that. I don't, I don't think that's really the case. I think that really, really challenging art is, is left out uh, for, for a reason because it's, it's uncomfortable, it's whatever. And I don't, because I mean, I think the, the bar changes, doesn't it? It's like uh, what was uh, perhaps challenging in the fifties is not anymore. And I think that um, going forward, not taking cheap shots at, you know, low hanging fruit, um, you know, desecrating you know, someone's religion, disrespecting religion or sexually explicit things. I think these are, these are all old news, you know, so. Uh, uh, I think these are things that the gallery spaces and things often think are shocking or provocative, but I think that was shocking and provocative yesterday. I think today's shock and provocation comes from something else. Um, I think perhaps sometimes it's a, a disquiet that it makes you feel, you know, you see a lot of like singularity movements of movies about like artificial intelligence and you know, robots taking over the world, but I think this idea externalizes something that happens inside of us when we confront uh, the reality of technology and, and what it does to our humanity. What, you know, like if you, if you can create a human and you know, there's all these ideas of uh, what it means to be human and uh, how we ought to treat each other and uh, what are the barriers and what are the, where, where is the boundary between what's human and what's not. And um, I think these sort of things, exploring these sort of concepts and not just haphazardly but really acquiring skills to do that I think is is the new uh is the new challenge